Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast, number 10, 10th episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. Uh, I'm Sean, this is Evan, and uh, we talk about latest news in the cryptocurrency community, uh, specifically most often relating to Bitcoin, the most popular one, my personal favorite, the one that I hope changes the world. Um, but there's also a lot of potential in these other coins, a lot of potential in um, decentralized platforms that are being developed. And, uh, you know, a lot of our conversation a lot of the time leads down the road to uh, decentralization and other topics. Because that's the, yeah, that's the fascinating part, you know, stuff that can change the world, you know? Yeah. Oh, hey, nice shirt, by the way. Hogwarts. Oh, yeah, thanks. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wizard. What house are you in? Uh, Ravenclaw. Me too. Oh, very nice. Oh, Ravenclaw buddies. Sweet. Yeah, you We're know, the smart ones. as soon as Hogwarts starts taking Bitcoin, um, for tuition, <laughs> yeah, for, tu- for tuition, um, I'm going to, I'm going to attend and yeah, uh, I'm going to apply. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they aren't, they aren't taking it yet. So still waiting. Maybe they'll come out with like wizard coin or something. <laughs> but anyway, um, enough Hogwarts talk. Um, so, uh, let's start with our first topic for today. Um, we're gonna dive into regulation talk. Uh, we hit, we touch upon this almost every week, especially since the Bit License regulations came out. So uh, the Bitcoin Foundation um, has taken some criticism in the past by some members in the community and us specifically as well for you know trying to support uh, the the issuance of regulations by regulators in government. And, um, you know, they got what they asked for in the bit license, but it turned out to be too big of a pill for them to swallow, it seems like. Uh, uh, the, the head of the Bitcoin, or the general counsel, what is he, the, Jim Harper, he's, uh, yeah, his he's a... Yeah, his, his title is public, or global policy counsel. Okay, okay, global policy counsel. So he's, he's a big so, shot. Yeah, he's basically just the foundation's lawyer, as that's what I take from it. Okay, alongside um, Patrick Merck, who's the general counsel. So I don't know what the difference exactly is between oh, general he, counsel and global policy counsel. The global, he probably is just specifically focuses on governments then. Gotcha. All right, so what, um, what was Jim Harper's uh, you know, formal response to the bit license regulations that were proposed in New York? Yeah, so... He wrote an open letter to the New York Department of Financial Services, uh, and it was published on the Bitcoin Foundation's blog. And he basically, really all he said was that the 45-day public commenting period was too short and that the foundation should um, release the risk assessment they did for Bitcoin when they first started their uh, research for the bit license regulation. Um, and that's pretty much all he said. He gave a suggestion for a different process they could use for um, opening uh, future drafts of the legislation to the public. Um, but he didn't, he didn't criticize the regulation at all. He just said that the department needs to communicate with the public better. Wow, I'm surprised he... I'm surprised he didn't go farther and actually criticize parts of the regulation. Because I know that mem- certain members of the Bitcoin Foundation do have issues with parts of the bit license. So, you know, why not come out and be public about specifically what parts? Just, you know, just asking for an extension in the comment period, that would be great. I think that they should do it. But, you know, when, when you're the global policy council, you know, the lead government lawyer, uh, for the Bitcoin Foundation, like you know, take you should take um, you should take a bigger step, you know, uh, for for advocating for what you think would be best for the community and and the industry. Like chances are they're not going to listen to you anyway for the forty five day extension or whatever. But you know, yeah, it's almost up, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I I feel like we're we're about halfway through at this point. Um, maybe maybe we're farther. I'm not sure, but you know, that's when you think about that's only that's only a month and a half, really. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like that's that's not a lot of time, and 
the community is barely beginning to digest all of this. Um, I did my interview with Eric Voorhees last week, and um, super interesting. I super recommend you know everyone watching this. If you haven't read it or seen it yet, um, I'll put the link in the description uh, for the interview. But you know Eric Voorhees got into some really interesting issues about privacy of the bit license reg uh, regulations and um, how how it'll also uh, hurt businesses in the free market from from getting started. And, you know, if, if that's not getting mentioned by Jim Harper from the Bitcoin Foundation, if the real issues aren't getting tackled by the people who have the most influence, then, th you know, the worst is going to happen. The worst possible outcome is going to is, is going to. Yeah. Happen. Um, all all Harper said in his letter, um, like directly referring to the legislation was that um, the proposed regulations were very sweeping and could and would likely affect people even outside of New York, even outside of the United States. But f from what I took from it, at least, he didn't even, he didn't present that as a necessary negative of the law. He just, um, he just used that as a reason for why the commenting period should be extended because people should have, people need more than 45 days to read everything, to like digest it, and to, um, like research and become familiar with the New York uh, regulatory system, not necessarily that just the law on principle is bad. I got you. I got you. So does it does it seem like they're in general supporting it? I mean, I know that high profile companies with who are you know members of the Bitcoin Foundation, um, you know Coinbase and BitPay are two of the biggest ones. Payment processors for Bitcoin. Uh, they have di done formal letters in the past to the New York Department of Financial Services saying that they support uh, the the general idea of a bit license and saying this, they support certain regulations around Bitcoin. But, I mean, is there any indication that that the foundation will, you know, ch change course a little bit now that we know that the the potential regulations on the horizon um, are pretty detrimental to the industry. Yeah, it sounds like um, from how I interpreted it, it sounds like uh, Jim Harper, who is acting on behalf of the foundation. So you know, we can safely say it was their opinion too. But he hasn't. He didn't come out and say that this is a good idea. But the tone of his letter just sounds like. Um, the foundation has pretty much given up um, if if they ever were against it in the first place but they've just they've just accepted that it's going to happen no matter what and that um, they just want to make it as painless as possible because Harper's um, focus in the letter his reason for um, extending the comment period was to get the community more involved so um, so the community and this uh, department could work together to come to um, regulation that they both agreed on. You know, so yeah. it doesn't really seem like he was outright supportive of the law, but it just kind of feels like, what I took from it at least, it kind of feels like he's just given up. The foundation has just given up. and um, Like they kind of see New of, York as a lost cause or something? Yeah, like... Um, Instead of fighting it, they're just going to make it as painless as possible. For them. Because it's still going to yeah. be painful as all hell for the businesses that want to get yeah. started in New York. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, um, you know, how, how um, liberal it is. Not liberal in the political sense, but liberal as, like, uh, you know, freedom. Mm. It, you know, it doesn't matter how loose these regulations are. Um, it's still going to, you know hinder business because it's you know basically telling you if you don't do this you can't operate and um, yeah you know even if you're outside of our state you still can't operate if you have customers that are in our state yeah so but you know from what I take from it and you know if we if we have any repeat viewers they already know my stance on the Bitcoin Foundation I don't think it should even exist because all they do is just you know buddy up with the governments and 
they're surprised that this is what happens when they do that. But um, yeah, it like really my opinion on the Bitcoin Foundation is like don't they don't really care about um, they don't really care about watching it flourish or even experimenting with the free market. You know, I wrote an op-ed article about Jim Harper's response. Um, I basically said that he did far too little. Um, he requested far too little in in his letter. Um, and because they don't really care about um, about saving uh, or preserving the freedom surrounding Bitcoin, um, it's not even really on their radar, is it? Yeah, yeah. They just care about keeping it alive long enough to make as much money as possible from these uh, membership fees and other donations they get from giant uh, businesses that accept Bitcoin and have joined the foundation. Because, you know, as long as they're doing something with the government, these mainstream companies are going to think they're doing something productive. And so they'll, you know, keep renewing their membership. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a parasitic relationship a little bit. They're, they're, they're just mm -hmm. sucking th these, these, uh, these funds from these companies and using it for, you know, kind of controversial ends. Yeah, and you see, like, my personal stance on it is... Um, I obviously think it would work better on a free market, but even like if we just assume for the sake of argument that um, that it won't or it's it's unsure because there's a lot of people who you know obviously don't believe in a free market at all. At least it's a chance to experiment in a free market, you know, yeah. without anybody really losing too much because there's not that many people who are like 100% invested in Bitcoin, so. There, it's not like there's going to be um, lives that are ruined if Bitcoin fails as a result of, uh, of deregulation. Yeah. So even even if you don't agree with the free market, at least give us Bitcoin so you can prove us wrong. You know, <laughs> like if if you don't let something, if you don't let us experiment with it, then you're not even you're never even going to have the chance to get ev evidence to prove us wrong yeah you know so at the very least it should be the freedom should be preserved so we can at least uh, you know experiment it with with liberty because it's something that just doesn't really exist anymore it is it's a very fun experiment you know it's it's some it's a technology that has never really existed before and uh we finally have a way to ha have a reliable form of money you know in our pockets or on our computers or on a piece of paper even and um, you know it's cryptographically verified, and has the you know the state of the art blockchain technology that was barely invented five years ago, and regulators want to tell us how we can use that technology. So yeah, good luck with that. Yep. Despite despite all the wealth they've seen created with it, you know, like we have these exchanges that have popped up almost overnight completely deregulated because they operate outside of all the financial laws around the world because you know the governments just didn't they didn't realize bitcoin was there for you know most of its life so far and um you know a lot of people have gotten rich off of it and aside from mount gox you know not not that many people have been hurt unless it's from their own, you know, stupidity. Well, I will say, back in the day, um, it wasn't Mt. Gox specifically, but uh, Bitflora.com. I was storing a certain amount of bit Bitcoins on Bitflora.com, and uh, but this is back when there was only like one wallet around, and I didn't feel like running it all the time on my, on my laptop, and Bitflora.com disappeared without warning. Uh, checked back a week later. Uh, websites down and everything can't log into my or I could log into my account but it wouldn't let me withdraw my bitcoins I saw them in the balance right there uh, but uh, couldn't couldn't withdraw and um, so you know this that's the type of screw-ups that you know New York's trying to prevent but they it's it's a power play really they can't actually yeah. prevent stuff like this they just well, want yeah, power they, over people you know they can't it doesn't matter how hard they regulate the the businesses they're not going to be able to keep an exchange from failing if it's not profitable yeah. unless they bail it out which you know let's pray they don't do that yeah with but, what money you ain't got yeah. bitcoins to bail them out and you know yeah. what are you going to do dig deeper into the national debt <laughs> but you know like you said the exchange just like 
went under overnight without warning and you lost like you lost access to your bitcoins but like i said user error you know don't don't store your bitcoins on an exchange wallet because you don't really have ownership over those coins yeah and so yeah should have so, stored you know, it on on bitcoin qt would have been the smart way like now um, we have so many wallets that so there's so many options no one has any excuse for losing bitcoins on a website that goes under no one has any excuse yeah and um you know so so again like the only there's been two major bitcoin thefts um that i know of at least in the history of bitcoin one was mount gox failure two was when the FBI stole the bitcoins from everybody on Silk Road. Um, one of those uh, was the result of a free and unregulated market because Bitcoin is, exchange was a new thing. Um, you know, these people, the people who were in charge of it, um, Mark Karpelas especially, didn't really have a ton of experience in, in you know, high stakes financial industry, and uh, and everybody learned from that after Mount. Yeah, they were the crashed. first one and. And the second major one came from the government, who's supposed to be protecting us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So demise of Silk Road was completely—I mean, obviously, completely the fault of the government. They did it. Yeah, and now, and now, um, Ross Ulbricht—he's or not, not him directly, but his defense team is saying that uh, the FBI didn't have a proper search warrant when they did that. So yes. you know, not. Not only is this giant agency that's supposed to be protecting our liberties, not only are they infringing our freedom of choice, but they're doing it illegally by violating the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think Americans should uh, place too much faith in the Bill of Rights anymore. Yeah, that's, because, <laughs> that's long gone. Yeah, I mean, we're taught to, to worship that, that little document, you know, in seventh grade. But, uh, you know, we fo follow the news and you'll see examples every so often or very often, actually, where the government violates the Bill of Rights on a, on a regular basis, mm -hmm. whether it's the Fourth Amendment or First Amendment, Second Amendment, uh, Tenth Amendment states. Right. I mean, you go down the list and it always happens. It doesn't matter. No one yeah, is I held just, accountable. I just think it's um, pretty ironic how there's people in the Bitcoin community and you know it's understandable because it's, it's expanded far beyond you know this little libertarian bubble right but yeah, um, it, it amazes me how like just people in general um, have this belief or, or they have this um, they have this trust in a government that um, that they'll protect us even though historically they've you know never done so really and um, yeah it's and kind of like even, a religion almost they have faith yeah, in it What's even more comical is that there's people who are supporting the New York State government, which is far more tyrannical than the federal government oh, has yeah. ever been. Yeah. Well, anyone who's supporting the New York regulations is, I mean, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but either you're, you're misinformed about what's actually in the regulations and, and, and how it'll affect the industry, or you stand to make a lot of money off of the regulations and how mm -hmm. it'll constrict uh, businesses from, from forming that might compete with your established business. So, um, you know, it, it, people should just f support the free market more instead of, you know, relegating their rights, you know, away to some, you know, uh, you know weird authority who, who can't actually get the job done. Yeah, but you know, to be fair, um, even though I have seen a lot of people in the big community who have wanted government involved in Bitcoin, I haven't seen that many people supporting the bit license mm. regulation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, like you said, the only people I've seen that have supported it are, um, you know, people who don't like really understand um, like basic economics or people who stand to make a lot of money off of it, like the exchanges. Um, who have come out in support of it? You know, or the payment because, processors, Coinbase and BitPay, they support yeah. the general concept of the Bit license. Yeah, and it's because um, they're not really invested in it ideologically uh, as much as they are, you know, financially. So, um, you know, and if they make if they make the government too mad, um, you know, they're going to go out of business. So of course, it's in their best interest to support this regulation because it's going to keep them around longer. 
But, um, you know, the individuals who aren't really um, profiting off Bitcoin, uh, unless they work for Bitcoin, but most people just buy it from an exchange. You know, I haven't really seen a whole lot of those people um, come out in support of BitLicense. Yeah, I you know, I bet a lot of those people who just deal with Bitcoin, you know, as maybe a side project in life, maybe just like a, a passing interest that they that they like to trade in it occasionally or whatever, or experiment, you know, those are the kind of people who really need an extension in the bit license comment period. Because they aren't paying that much attention. They've got probably like full time jobs that they go to, you they got families that they take care of. They don't have the time to sit down and read a a 40 page document of proposed regulations for Bitcoin, you know? So that's, that's really why we need an extension in this period for yeah. the whole community to get up to speed on it. But, but an interesting point, just to play devil's advocate. And I want, I'm interested in what your opinion is on it. The people, the few people I have seen who have been in support of it, um, they say it's a good idea not necessarily because the regulation will keep us safe, but because, um, you know, it's better than the other government alternative, which is an outright ban. So, if, um, you know, so I think that they're under the impression that government is going to get involved no matter what, so it's better for them to pass regulation that keeps it in the mainstream on the white markets than if they just had an outright ban on it, which would push it down, you know, back to the dark net and into black markets like drugs and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's what like do you think it's worth it or do you even think it's necessary? Do you even think that would happen if there was an outright ban on Bitcoin? <sighs> you know, um, it's hard to say. I'm not sure what an outright ban in the United States would look like. Uh, like if 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 Obama came out tomorrow and said that virtual currencies are dangerous, they support global terrorism, and he goes down this long laundry list of like things wrong with Bitcoin and virtual currencies. Um, you know what? That okay? Coinbase, BitPay, these large companies that have set up. You know they. They, they. I don't know. They might shut down. Some of them might shut down. They might be too terrified. But like the, the overall like grassroots community, um, would probably just look at that and be like, well, should I listen to this asshole government who you know massacres people, on a on a yearly basis in whatever new war they came up with, <laughs> and, and and all these bullshit laws, or should I just keep doing what I'm doing anyway? And, you know, the government doesn't have nearly enough manpower to go around, you know, arresting people who work in Bitcoin and confiscating their mining machines and like all, all of this. Like I it's it's a scenario that I think that even people in the government realize that they could never really pull off. Not in a, not in a country as big and diverse as the United States. There's other smaller countries that might be able to ban Bitcoin more effectively because they have smaller jurisdictions. Um, Argentina, Ecuador, specifically, but you know, it's, I just I don't think that that would have really that much impact in, in the United States at all. And actually, if the if the government did try to ban Bitcoin, that would have some pretty big headlines across news organizations mm -hmm. and actually promote Bitcoin more to the masses. People want to do something more when it's not allowed. So people would research it more at the very least. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to agree with you because, um, you know, I, I think a, an outright ban on Bitcoin would motivate a lot of people who are really interested in Bitcoin, but who are, you know politically agnostic they don't care either way what happens uh, politically they're just not interested I think it would inspire a lot of those people um, to actually take a stance on something and um, mm -hmm. you know just practice some good old-fashioned civil disobedience <laughs> and just like ignore it and um, yeah hell yeah like I, I think there's a pretty good we have a pretty good example of that with China you know how many times have they tried to ban it and how well has it worked out for them you know they haven't even been able to shut down the exchanges yet yeah yeah that's another uh, example like that they have a big large country with a ton of people in it and it's pretty hard to ban something that people can just use on their computers yeah and the Chinese government has um, 
much more power over their people than the United States government does because you know they they came from you know um, a communist background. Uh, they're yeah. still communist in name, but not necessarily communist in practice. But they still are pretty oppressive when it comes to civil liberties. Very controlling. Um, so they have they have a lot more resources that they can use to um, put down any uh, political uh, dissident uh, activity uh, that the U.S. just doesn't have, and they and um, China hasn't really been successful in their band, so I don't see uh, why the U.S. would be successful in theirs. Yeah, and Russia, Russia has supposedly banned Bitcoin again. Um, good luck. I don't know. <laughs> like yeah, I don't know I don't how successful that's going to be in the short term. I don't think theirs is actually an effect though. Uh, they've they passed some amendments, or they're adding some amendments onto a law that's pending. Uh, getting ready to go into effect, and um, once this law goes into effect, the amendments would ban it. Um, mm-hmm. But they've already had a ban in place since February, I think, and uh, you know they didn't really enforce it. It didn't really stop any Bitcoin activity in Russia, from what I know. Yeah, it's hard to enforce that stuff. Um, but in in a different foreign country like Argentina. Um, where Bitcoin is barely getting off the ground. It's Bitcoin is farther behind in Argentina than it is in the United States, for sure, and also farther behind than it is in, in China and Russia. Argentina had their single Bitcoin exchange taken down by the government. Is that correct? Yeah, there's only one Bitcoin exchange in Argentina, which I didn't know. I thought that was pretty interesting. And um, didn't necessarily have it taken down by the government. Uh, it's, most likely it was an uh, an indirect consequence of the government, but um, what happened was this exchange. Their their name is Unisend. So Unisend was uh, partnered with two Argentinian banks. Uh, they had bank accounts, so they could have fiat reserves. And um, just out of the blue, one day they got um, a notice from both banks and. Uh, each bank sent their notice to Unison like within two or three days of each other, I think, uh, just notifying them that uh, they had ten days to get their affairs in order because their accounts were being shut down by the banks. And okay. by the banks, yeah. And um, there was a representative from Unison who talked to CoinDesk, uh, which was my source for the article I wrote on it for Coin Brief. And he talked to CoinDesk and said that um, it's probably their Unison isn't expecting it to hinder their business any because they have contingency plans, they have backup banks that they're going to be working with. Hmm. Um, but they suspect that it, that uh, the the two banks that they were working with probably shut down their um, accounts because of some new legislation that went into effect on the first of August. And um, it was a new, some new financial rules, and it required any money uh, service businesses in Argentina to report all of their Bitcoin activity directly to the um, financial regulatory uh, department of the Argentinian government. And um, you know, obviously, that's going to create a lot of hassle. So, for businesses that are dealing with a currency in a country where it hasn't really taken off yet, so the banks probably just thought it would be too much trouble. To deal with this one uh, like small exchange, yeah. So they just shut the accounts down. Okay, that sounds kind of like the reaction that a lot of U.S. banks have had towards customers who deal in Bitcoin. You know, large amounts of of Bitcoin transfers. Uh, you know, transfer fiat to banks, and the banks don't want to deal with potential regulatory implications. And they just shut the accounts down. So it, it appears that this happened basically on a, on a large scale. And, you know, it seems like Argentina's banking infrastructure might be highly centralized. So when a couple banks say that we don't want to deal with, uh, uh, you know, this Bitcoin exchange, then, you know, that that's very crippling to it because there's, there's so few options in, in a country with so many currency controls and, and overall like a, a – a, a messed up government in terms of how they deal with the economy overall. Yeah, that's actually um, interesting. The the representative that talked to um, CoinDesk brought that up. 
Argentinian government actually defaulted on the national debt recently. And on the day that they defaulted on their debt, um, this guy said that Unison saw their most active um, day um, of the entire month uh, as far as, you know, Bitcoin activity goes. And he said that, that normally from his observations just working for an exchange that um, activity fluctuates with the Bitcoin price, right? So, you know, when the price goes up, there's more activity. When it goes down, there's more activity. Um, but this had nothing to do with changes in the price. It was a direct result of the government defaulting on their debt. Lots of people bought Bitcoin, and he speculated uh, that it was because people in that moment lost faith in their uh, government's ability to steer the economy. So they started looking for alternative ways to preserve their wealth. They turned to Bitcoin. So yeah. Bitcoin's definitely not going anywhere. Yeah. It's stay it's staying and it's there to stay in Argentina. Yeah. It's just a minor setback. But Argentina is like the perfect place for Bitcoin to take off because they just have an incredibly shaky um economy there and it's you know just a perfect place for Bitcoin to swoop in and save the day. Yeah, you know, if we could just get those people, you know, all some cheap smartphones with, you know, a, a solid Bitcoin wallet application on the smartphone um, that would seriously empower all the people in that country to, you know, control their finances better and stop depending on centralized banks, you know, uh, to, to handle their money. So it's it's coming down the line. It's just happening slowly, and we're we're still in the phase in part of the world where, uh, you know, governments are failing in some ways. You know, in in terms of like defaulting on the national debt or whatever, um, like Cyprus did uh, like a year or two years ago, and people started buying Bitcoin a lot. So we're still in that phase in certain in certain countries. It just doesn't have that big of an effect on the price now. Because um, Bitcoin overall is, is, is so much more global and, and integrated with various economies. So yeah, yeah, and really, um, it's actually a lot easier than getting everybody cheap smartphones because you don't even necessarily need a smartphone. Uh, there's lots of people in African countries uh, who, like, there's been something developed. I don't know, exactly know the technical inner, inner workings of it, but uh, they can they can do Bitcoin transactions just on regular cell phone network. By like text, um, text message, M SMS? Yeah, because they, they can do that with regular banks. You know, they can do wire transfers and stuff through text messaging, and somebody just got the idea to, you know, put Bitcoin on that type of infrastructure. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you, really, you don't even need a, um, a smartphone to do it. And I saw a guy on Reddit a few, a few weeks ago, who posted the source code to this proof of concept project he he did um to where he made this uh he built this application that lets you uh, send bitcoin or lets you broadcast the blockchain over radio frequencies oh yeah nice so so you can you could sit and receive bitcoin <laughs> with with your fm radio <laughs> oh uh, man <laughs> you know if if something like that were to ever be refined and you know make usable it's crazy how bitcoin can just piggyback on these old technologies and, and still use them for like distributing the blockchain and broadcasting transactions and such yeah so like it's definitely a lot of people a lot of bitcoin skeptics use the uh, lack of technology in the underdeveloped world as a reason for why it can't succeed but the market is solving that. We're figuring out how to get Bitcoin to places that don't have smartphones and, com and fancy computers. It's like, it's yeah. pretty awesome. I guess theoretically, you could you could send and receive Bitcoin using an SMS service, you know, with a, an old crappy Nokia phone from like 1998. <laughs> you can play some Snake on there, and then when you're playing <laughs> Snake, send some Bitcoin to your merchant for your loaf of bread or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And also... Um, the the Bitcoin skeptics who use the lack of technology as an argument, they don't realize that lots of places in Africa are becoming pretty industrialized. Um, you know, there's a large portion of the African population, you know, in the various states of Africa, um, that, you know, there's a very significant population of, of those, a portion of those populations that actually do already have smartphones. 
Yeah. Um, you know, they, you know, they're getting, they're starting to develop. It's not how it was. Yeah. You know, 10, 20 years ago. And and how can you say that that's a knock against Bitcoin? That you know, there's not enough technology in the hands of people to you know actually support a national economy or whatever. Well, that's going to change. I don't know if people with that viewpoint have noticed, but technology is 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 spreading pretty quickly (laughs) you know it's it's advancing and and it's pretty soon well maybe not soon but you know down the line it's very likely that everyone is going to have like a smartphone like device and it'll be relatively easy to get a hold of and you know there's now we have wi-fi that can reach up to 62 miles or 100 kilometers and and once we start implementing that, basically everyone's going to have internet access, and everyone's going to have these yeah. smartphones. So you can basically have the entire world internet at your fingertips, and d- despite living in a country that has screwed you over with their crappy economic policies. Yeah, you I mean, you don't even you don't even necessarily need Wi-Fi anymore. They have these, you know, they have these little you know, four G broadcasters that take four G signal, cell phone signal, and turn it into a Wi-Fi hotspot. Mm-hmm. And um, you know those those could take off in the developing world. And um, you know, just yeah. an interesting point uh, that I want to bring up is that uh, cell phones, smartphones are spreading faster than any technology that you know has ever existed. You know, there's people in the third world. Who have access to so a smartphone? Nice. You know, yeah. granted, it's not the iPhone 1200. Yeah, and um, it's not it's probably not a Samsung Galaxy S5 either. Yeah, but it's not, you know, it's not one of those, you know, bricks from the 80s either. You know, they 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 have access to fairly modern cell phones, and um, you know, it could be a coincidence, but cell phone manufacturing uh, companies. It's one of the least regulated industries there is, and they, it's they, it's one of the industries that has the fastest falling prices, and it's seen rapid growth. And uh, is it a coincidence? I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, either either way, coincidence or not, it's it's great that you know technology is advancing at such a fast rate and getting in the hands of more and more people across the globe. You know, um, pretty soon we'll you know if everyone has access to you know the, uh, the internet and and can transact in bitcoin uh with you know these devices in their hands a- across the world globally uh that has huge implications for free trade and you know the global economy um which which brings me to something i wanted to talk about um open bazaar has released their teaser trailer for their for their new decentralized market totally open market and it looks fantastic i'm really excited about it it really has the potential to you know take the concepts and functionality of ebay and craigslist and you know implement it in just a computer program that allows anyone around the world to you know make contracts make transactions buy products online um there's going to be escrow services uh dispute mediation services and it's all, all going to be funded um, by, by, well, not, not funded, but, like, people will be able to choose different, like, mediators depending on their reputation. And, uh, you know, there's going to be, like, a voting system. And, and um, it, lo- it looks fantastic, basically. And it's, it's really going to empower people when it, when it comes out. Yeah, I think I've been excited about... Open Bazaar ever since it came out as Dark Market, you know, um, just because of how well the first Silk Road worked, um, you know, regardless regardless how of how you feel, how successful it was, yeah, yeah, regardless of how you feel about um, about drugs or whether or not they should be legal, y- you know, you can't really deny that um, Silk Road was a great business model, it, you know, yeah. yeah. It wasn't Silk Road wasn't decentralized, of course, but um, it had a lot of the features that Open Bazaar is using, like uh, reputation tracking, um, 
trustless uh, arbitration for disputes, escrow services, uh, things like that. And it made um, it made the the drug trade, uh, as far as Silk Road goes, made it really peaceful and as legitimate as an illegal business could be. Um, and they did it outside of any government regulation, obviously because it's illegal. So just imagine what a trading platform could do because that's all open bazaar is it's just it's just a platform it's just a it's just a market uh that people can go to to sell things you know it's not its own business or anything it's just something anybody can use to set up their business and it's designed specifically for um trustless uh interactions with other people uh and it's it's totally decentralized. It can't be taken down by anything. So literally any business, black market or white market, can thrive on it. And I think it's just yeah. pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they. I'm 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 amazed at the the kind of features that they're that they're planning to to get in the works. Um, they call it Ricardian contracts. I'm still doing some research on on how all these things work, and I certainly don't understand how the programming uh works to create these features but you know they you know they put they could potentially have uh, currency exchanges on open bazaar um basically filling the role of bitstamp or mint pal or whatever um they 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 have this long list of like potential applications of of contracts and it's just built right into the bitcoin blockchain so that's that's exciting in its own right that that you know that they're turning this open market into something so much more and, you know, uh, potentially so much more revolutionary. So, uh, the, the, the beta, the beta comes out at the end of August and then 1.0 is scheduled to be released in December. Right now it's an alpha phase. You can actually go on, um, on the GitHub profile page and actually use an alpha version of open bazaar and kind of get to know the ui you can actually suggest um improvements to the ui to the developers so you know they're being totally open about developing this and you can go on and read all the docu documentation about what they want to implement it's really super exciting so how do you think it's going to turn out like do you think there's going to be uh really huge businesses that use it or is it going to you know, s stay in the uh, like the Etsy kind of atmosphere where people just sell like you know handmade goods, or is it just going to be used for drugs? What do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a combination of those things. Um, you know, Silk Road was mostly used for drugs, although th there were uh, some legal uses for it, as well as a couple really extreme uses like you know gun sales and. and or assassination contracts and stuff but um, open bazaar is being built as a platform they're really trying to be open to any kind of economic transaction between people like even even um, trading shares might be implemented as a possible feature trading shares of, of companies in a decentralized way so um, like it's it's hard to predict exactly what it'll be used for. I mean, obviously, people will sell drugs on there. That's a given. Um, but they're they're building so much more on top of it so that it can be so much more. Uh, as for, like, big businesses getting on to Open Bazaar and, like, selling products, I don't think that's really going to happen a lot because big businesses already have their platforms that they already use to sell products and, you know, hold a, a customer following so they don't have any really re reason to get on open bazaar but it's mostly going to empower individuals like etsy type people who like to make their own products and just sell it to anyone who will buy it out on the open market you know there's going to be categories you can place your thing in a, in a category and uh and totally uncensored you can put literally like anything you want you know i could take my, my you know toenail clippings and sell them <laughs> sell them on there like what if a celebrity wants to go on there and and what if kim kardashian wants to you know clip some toenail clippings and and put them on <laughs> open bazaar and sell them for like a thousand dollars or something someone would buy it but yeah. you're not that like if if that was on ebay 
if Kim Kardashian tried to do that on eBay, you know, that post would probably get deleted by eBay because that's that would be against some kind of rule there. But, you know, open bazaar, totally open. You sell all the toenail clippings you want. You know, ch- you know Kim gets a, gets a haircut or whatever. Sean Penn gets a haircut. I don't know. Obama wants to sell his his old pair of glasses on open bazaar. <laughs> like this is, this is really going to empower individuals who just have an idea to sell something and, and put it online and make a transaction with someone across the world. Yeah. My first, my first thoughts, uh, about open bazaar was that, you know, you know, like, Oh, it'll never leave the Etsy stage. It'll always be little, you know, arts and crafts, handmade things, uh, that people make, but the, you know, then I started thinking more about what it actually was, and uh, like, there's really, there's really no rules. It's, it's just a place where people can go to sell things. It's a, a true, you know, it's a true marketplace. Um, it's just a digital version of it. Uh, you know, like you don't, there's no like stores or anything you have to go to. So, I don't see, you know, and like you said, I don't really think that. Um, any you know previously existing businesses, um, even if they already accept Bitcoin, I can't see them like moving their business over to Open Bazaar just because they've already spent so much money becoming compliant with financial regulations and things like that. They've just got really they've be, got their stuff going. For yeah, them. it wouldn't They're really be profitable up. for them to do so. But um, but you know, small business, small Etsy type businesses could turn into big businesses because. You know, on on Etsy, I've like I've never I've been on Etsy, but I've never bought anything from them. I've definitely never like sold, set up a shop with them or anything. Um, you know, but I'm sure there's lots of you know rules that you have to follow when you're when you're on Etsy, and I'm sure that they take a a cut of uh, whatever uh, revenue you make as like you know a service fee or whatever. I'm not sure about that, but. But probably, yeah. I mean, we'd probably. have to do some research, but um, and so i like a lot of people who start out on Etsy and they get really big. Well, they don't stay on Etsy. They go and make their own website, right? And you know, it has to be because it's it's hard to operate a big business on Etsy just because you can only go so far with it. Yeah. Um, but with and Open Etsy Bizarre, itself is a business, so you're basically yeah. just in someone else's system. Yeah, you're you're like a you're just basically like a subcontractor within you know like an umbrella company but with open bazaar it's not it's not a company it's not anything it's just a place where you can go to sell goods yeah you know no so profit people, motive for the creators at all yeah. they're just developers yeah. they're making this platform so if people can go on open bazaar and you know they sell products that enough people want and they're at the right price uh then yeah they'll get really big and since open bazaar itself is decentralized you know maybe the entire company could be decentralized you know countries nowadays they have they operate all over the world but they always have a country of origin they have a you know base of operations and that's where the majority of the financial laws apply is in the country of origin you know but that might not happen with open bazaar because you could have people from all over the world getting together to start a a business with each other and you know if they're all equal partners then there is no country of origin you know so not and only it's not does, really necessary to define one at all. It's just people. Yeah, yeah. Because you just go there, you just go there and and sell stuff, and then how the business uh, divides up the the profit, it, you know, that's up to them. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what their business model is, whether they're it's one person or whether it's a lot of people who are in the same country or whether it's people from all over the world working together. Uh, it's it just doesn't matter, uh, and so. What Open Bazaar is, uh, like just the nature of Open Bazaar, that alone would decentralize, would you know, kind of create a decentralized economy. But then once businesses get bigger, and then um, there's there's really no uh, you know centralized headquarters for the business. That you know, that makes the economy even more peer to peer, and it's going to make it even harder to break up if anybody yeah. ever tries to. Yeah, that'll scare governments. That's for sure. No country of origin. What? What are? What are you? How do? How do? We don't know. We don't know how to define you. So using a platform that that is just a program, just some computer code. 
how do we how do we take you down if we don't like what you're selling? How's it gonna yep, work? Like like just imagine you get one like one person from the US, one person from Argentina, and another person from like Italy or something. And they get together and they're they decide they're gonna sell this like online service or they're gonna make like make a video game or some kind of product or something that they're gonna sell and they're all going to be equal partners in the company. They're gonna like split up the profit evenly. Yeah. Uh you know, so there's no majority of the company in any country. So how how is anybody gonna apply any regulations to that? It's gonna be really hard to do so. Um if they if the governments want to bad enough, they're gonna have to, you know, do some pretty questionable things that, you know, break their own laws. So yeah, here's the solution to that. New world order. <laughs> One world government. It'll all their all the conspiracy theorists' fears will come true when the governments decide that the only way that they can regulate these global uh, you know, decentralized businesses is by becoming a global centralized government. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a country of origin if there's only one country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but, you know, old, old, again, old continental countries are outdated. We need a one world government to, to track you this. You know, even, even if that does ever become a serious idea that governments have, like, pretty much nobody on Earth supports that. Like, there's, there's a small group of, like, super socialists that are like, yeah, global government, so we can have a global wealth tax, but... Yeah. Kind of U- UN-minded people, right? People who support yeah. the UN, maybe making it most stronger. People, but most people who are just like, you know, average people, when they hear, you know, world government, they're like, what? No, that's tyranny. So yeah, that, you know, can, that, that if, can go downhill pretty fast. Yeah, so if Open Bazaar ever takes off and you have, like, pretty big businesses that compete with, like, uh, you know, the old style of conducting business... Uh, it'd be pretty hard for anybody to take it down, really, yeah. just because of how decentralized it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm super curious to find out how all this plays out, and we're gonna we're gonna find out over the next year or so. We're gonna see how governments uh, react to the concept of a decentralized online market that they can't go in and you know track one guy's phone calls and messages and, and find him in a library and arrest him and, and then steal his servers and steal his bitcoins. You can't. It's not It's not in one particular place for government thugs to go steal it. We've adapted p- beyond that. Yeah, but I don't know why. Maybe I'm just a pessimist, but I just have this really bad feeling that Open Bazaar is going to come out and all it's going to be used for is you're going to have, like, one guy like selling cookies or something and there's going to be a million drug dealers and there's going to be some <laughs> shady porn like i'm just afraid that that's what's going to happen with what, it. what about kim kardashian's toenail clippings don't forget that and she probably doesn't know what bitcoin is <laughs> hey. she can sell that on she can sell that on reddit there's a lot of really weird subreddits that that's, sell things like that <laughs> that's true that's true that's true yeah um so we're almost done with the podcast, but there's one other topic that I wanted to get to in this one, which is uh, the infamous at this point Zappo debit card, which was hyped for many months as a uh, possible solution for people who want to go spend their bitcoins around the around the world at any merchant who already takes credit cards and debit cards. And, uh, you know, just swipe a card and money comes out of your Bitcoin wallet or whatever and and you're good to go. And uh, Zappo received a bunch of venture funding. I think it was over like over $12 million, probably a lot more than that. Um, and, you know, a lot of people were excited. But as the debit card actually began to roll out, um, people realized that this isn't all it's cracked up to be that a lot of the same fees are associated with it as regular debit and credit cards so Zappo had to do some backpedaling a little bit um, in terms of what they promised and eventually even had to tell people that we we will cover those fees that might be lev- levied against you by the legacy banking system don't worry it's all good Please still love us. <laughs> um, <laughs> please still use our product. We'll cover it for you. So, you know, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah. So, I was one of the people who were 
super excited about Zappo. Um, cause you know, there's not, there is not really a globally available, you know, Bitcoin debit card. You can put, you can put Bitcoins on like a prepaid card or do like some, like something to yeah, get it there's, on there there's, there's a PayPal then, method that I, that I've been using, but I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. And then there's, there's a couple Bitcoin debit card services in Canada, some other ones in some other places. But other than that, there's there's no other like real actual Bitcoin debit card. So when I found out about Zappo, actually, it was when I read your article that you wrote, you know, a few months ago. Um, I got really excited yeah. because obviously, you know, I write for Coinbrief. I get paid in Bitcoin. Like, how how much easier would it be? Like, if I wanted to buy something from a store that doesn't accept Bitcoin, I gotta, you know sell my bitcoins on coinbase wait four days for it to go in my bank account yeah. and then go buy it if i had a, if i had a debit card it just wouldn't matter um so i was really excited about that and i was just as disappointed as everyone else was and what happened was that they started shipping out the cards in july like they said they're going to and some people in the u.s found out that it's not available in the U.S. Now, Zappo could have done the right thing, and they could have warned people ahead of time, or they could have been like, "This is a slight possibility that it won't that it won't be available in some countries." But they decided to wait until the people were actually confirming their shipping address so they could get the card to say, "Oh, we notice you have a uh, United States-based shipping address." Unfortunately. Due to U.S. financial regulations, we can't actually ship the card to your house. And so sorry, America. So people found out. Just Zappo treated it as an after as an afterthought. People found out it wasn't acceptable or it wasn't available in the U.S. Got kind of mad about that. But then there were some people. They were like, "Haha! Now the U.S. gets to know what it's like to not be able to use a Bitcoin service." Yeah. In their country, because you know, normally it's the other way around. It's available in the U.S., nowhere else. Yeah. Then a few days later, Zappo updated their FAQ page uh, where it says, "What about fees?" Um, before they made this update, it said, "All you have to pay is fifteen dollars to get the actual card. After that, that the there's promise. no fees." Yeah. Well, then they put up this little chart, and it had this huge list of fees. You know, like. Uh, like termination fees, maybe I think uh, monthly fee, uh, monthly service just fee, having just, the card. just having it. Currency conversions, like if you, you know, try to get a foreign currency you have, with your card, you have to pay a fee for that. ATM all these fees. fees, yeah, ATM fees, all these fees that uh, that you know they're pretty, they're common with uh, you know traditional debit and credit cards, but Zappo said we wouldn't have those fees. So people got really mad about that. So mad that Zappo actually had to make a post on their official blog, and they said, um, "They said, oh no, these these aren't the fees you're actually going to have to pay. We just put these fees on the website because um, this is what these are the kinds of fees that you have to pay on the legacy banking system, and since we're operating on an existing credit card infrastructure." You might have, you might, you might end up accidentally, yeah. you might accidentally get charged a fee, but don't worry, we're going to reimburse any fees you get charged. I didn't buy it. I don't think there were a lot of people that bought it, and Zappo pretty much ruined their reputation over the course of like three days. Yeah, I mean, really, like, they just hyped it up too much at the beginning, and, you know, maybe I'm personally responsible for that a little bit with my article i need to go back and and see how i covered that exactly to see if i made it sound that you know there would be like no fees associated with it but you know they they should have been more transparent from the from the beginning um like just be honest with people like just let them know like people had already ordered the car and, and card and signed up for the service and they don't even know that these fees might be lev levied against them and just trying to backpedal now and saying, don't worry, we'll cover it for you. Like, already your re your reputation is is downgraded already at this point. So, I mean, 
I I still might get one, but uh, personally, like I I already have a solution for uh, like using a debit card um, with with Bitcoin with money that ca originally came from Bitcoin. Um, the the method that I use is through PayPal. Uh, I just go on local Bitcoins. Um, find a person who will buy my bitcoins for the best possible rate and sell it to them through PayPal. They pay me through PayPal. Usually they cover, um, they, they actually buy at a higher rate to cover the PayPal fees. So in the end, I'm getting the same, the same value, same amount of bitcoins that I would have gotten uh, from like selling through Coinbase or to someone for the actual exchange rate. And then once, it's, once the money's in my PayPal account, um, I have a PayPal uh, debit MasterCard, um, which enables me to just transfer the funds immediately from my PayPal account uh, to the debit MasterCard. And then that's obviously compatible with, with any, you know, debit credit uh, merchants that take that. And, you know, that's, that's a couple of, that's a few steps, but um, it's, it's, actually, it's actually pretty easy and straightforward once you do it a couple times. And the, the hardest part is just finding someone who will give you like a, a, a good rate on local Bitcoins in PayPal dollars. Um, you pretty much have to find someone who, uh, you know, you have, you have to go on in the middle of a day when, when there's a lot of people awake and, um, and find, just sort by best deal and, and, and do it that way. But that's been working out pretty well for me so far. And I actually see no reason to actually switch over to Zappo now. Uh, especially when it would cost fifteen dollars just to get the card, and you know, it, all the legacy banking and ATM fees and and all that associated with it, like the 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 PayPal debit card that I that I use for this that does have a five dollar monthly fee, um, but and then there's ATM fees as well if I go if I withdraw to a random ATM, but you know it's it's fairly straightforward and I just see no reason to to use Zappo at, at this point. Right. Well, with, with that method, you know, you actually have to have people in your area that are, you know, buying and selling Bitcoin. Not necessarily. Right? If you're doing it over if, over PayPal, um, it's basically it's basically anywhere. That's true. Because, see, my problem with local Bitcoins is that nobody in my area is has Bitcoin. Yeah, so you can't do it locally in like, person um, cash cash transaction. I, I went on there. Yeah. Yeah. Go like ahead. um, like I went on there, and there's like five people within a hundred mile radius of me, and none of them were buying; they were all selling, and their prices were like six hundred and seventy dollars. So, you know, there's there's not yeah, really a that's Bitcoin a bad deal. market in my area. That's pretty bad. Yeah. Deal. There's not really a Bitcoin market in my area. Yeah, I mean, but I, you know, I could always just put it in a different zip code and find you know deals that aren't in my area. Yeah, and like do don't don't do um, cash trend if you don't if you don't, if you're not looking for cash transactions, do online transactions instead, and that's how you find all the people who will transact through PayPal and other like random forms of money transfer like money pack and stuff that I have never used personally but um, yeah there's actually there's people who will pay a good rate in PayPal dollars if you can if you can find them in the right time of day and they'll cover the PayPal fees for you I don't know how they're able to do that and stay in business you know buying bitcoins on local bitcoins but somehow they do it and you know it's pretty straightforward the, the only like problem is if you secure your local bitcoins account with um, an authenticator like google authenticator for two-factor authentication um, you have to be pretty careful about um, about that because like I, I updated my phone and and reinstalled the google authenticator and now I had to wait two weeks uh, for to get access to my local bitcoins funds luckily that two weeks is just about up but you know the, it's it's um there's a way to do it there's a way to do it without having to rely on zappo yeah i just i wish it would be easier though like that's, it'll get easier in time that's the that's the next step towards you know mainstream adoption is you have you have to make it easy 
you have to make it easy enough for people to use uh, so that they actually, you know, have an incentive to switch over to it. Yeah. Like, you, you have to be able to use it at enough places so it needs enough merchant acceptance and it has to be easy for the average person to use it. Like, right now, there's a lot of steps involved. Like, you have to get a download a wallet, buy them on an exchange, you know, all this stuff. When we get when we get some like really um, intuitive things like debit cards and and stuff like that, it'll be just like a bank account, and people can use it and not even realize they're using bitcoins. Like it yeah. won't be much different for them, and, and that's when that's when Bitcoin will really take off. Yeah, there was a quote by someone I don't, I forget who it was, but um, I read it online somewhere. They said that Bitcoin will truly make it big when people are using it and they don't know that they're using Bitcoin. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I think we're on our way to that point and we're making progress. Is We're just not getting there as fast as some people, you know, kind of hoped idealistically based on promises by companies like Zappo. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of time and you still have to go through, you still have to deal with all the BS uh, banking fees that go along with regular credit and debit card systems. So, um, you know... I guess, you know, yeah. personally, I'm not going to use Zappo, but if other people want to try it, yeah, go go ahead and, um, you know, post your reviews online, post your reviews on Reddit about your experience with Zappo, like how many, how much fees did you actually experience and did Zappo actually reimburse you for it? You know, that the proof will be in the pudding about whether this is an actually uh, good product. Yeah, I was going to get one and do a review for it on CoinBrief, but... Not available in the U.S. So, but I mean, it's it's never gonna nothing's ever gonna go, you know, perfectly as planned, and it's it's not really a major setback to be honest, because you know how old is Bitcoin? Five years, and we're already we already have like early versions of Bitcoin debit cards. Yeah. You know, like how yeah. how long um how long did the dollar exist before credit cards and debit cards came into existence? <laughs> Um, and how long did it take between the first credit cards? Like, how long did it take starting out the first credit cards to get where they are today? You know, it took mm. decades, and yeah. we're five we're five years in, and we already have you know like a very crude version of debit cards already. So it's it's happening a lot faster than any other monetary technology ever has. We just have to be patient. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to look at it. Like when you put things in the big perspective, Bitcoin's only been around for five years. And even just even just a year ago, like in the summer of 2013, um, we had none of these services, not nearly as many wallets, um, definitely no debit cards that could possibly be linked to a, to a Bitcoin account. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess we have made a lot of progress in the past year. And people, people are trying to make even rapider progress for the next coming year. You know, it's just we need, we do need to be patient. Yep, and it just so happens Bitcoin is completely unregulated. For now, <laughs> <laughs> Go, going back to my going back to my little cell phone argument. Uh huh. It's why it's been progressing so rapidly because it's a free market. All right. Well. Um, I think that pretty much covers it for this episode of the podcast. So, yeah, I'm Sean Wentz. I'm Evan. And uh, so we will be back next week with another episode of the podcast. Um, we've got some more interviews in the works. Uh, I want to interview the Hive development team, the Hive Wallet. I've done a couple articles about them um, in the past, uh, hoping to snag one of the developers for, uh, for an interview. Uh, talk about new features coming up possibly and um and uh yeah uh stuff coming down the line and uh thank you guys for listening um subscribe please because <laughs> i think that we're pretty cool uh i like our podcast i think it's worth listening worth watching um also like our videos and stuff um i, I this isn't totally clear to, to some people watching but um you know, we we up we upload the entire podcast as one video, like an hour long, about um, to the to the YouTube channel, and then I kind of divide it up into segments based on topic, and then upload them as their own individual videos after that as well. 
so that um, people can go on and maybe just look at stories that they're interested in if they're only interested in decentralization topics versus, you know, wallet topics and stuff like that. Um, trying to divvy it up a little bit. And, um, yeah, so did you want to add anything before we uh, close this thing out? Follow us on Twitter. Oh, yeah, that's right, Twitter as well. So, yeah, um, we're both on Twitter. Uh, anyone watching, we got Twitter handles on each side of the screen. Uh, it's also in the YouTube description. And uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, check out coinbrief.net as well. Um, recent news in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. And uh, we'll see you guys next week with more news.